Hello everyone, my name is Thomas, and today in this video we're going to be talking about the color workspace in Adobe Premiere Pro. Today in this video we're going to be talking about the basic color correction and color grading properties of the program, and hopefully by the end you'll be able to do some basic color correction on your own images and film. So without further ado, let's get started. So I've already done the process of importing our footage, putting it in the timeline. Here we have our source, and here we have our timeline preview. I'll just open this up a little bit. So within this workspace, this is very similar to the assembly workspace that we started out with. Here we have our source, we have our project, uh, all of our folders and whatnot, uh, our timeline, and our program. Uh, this is basically our time timeline preview. But you'll see that we have a new panel now, um, and it's called Dimetri Color. And within this, it'll have six tabs. One might be open. Uh, basic correction is usually open. It might also be creative. But uh, you can just click uh, the names and they will open up. There are six tabs in here, basic correction, creative, curves, color wheels and match, HSL secondary, and vignette. In this video, we're going to be talking about basic correction, creative, vignette, and we're just going to get a sneak glimpse of what curves are. Uh, we'll go over curves, uh, color wheels and match, HSL secondary in a intermediate video. But for now, we'll just keep it simple. Now there's two ways to edit footage or film within Adobe Premiere Pro. One method is to directly edit the footage from your bin. So if you double click here, it'll pop up in your source. And from here, you can actually edit. So if I double click, it'll go up there. Um, and what I can do is I can go to basic correction, click the tab, and you'll see that we have a, a list of lots of little settings. Now let's, uh, an input let, uh, that let stands for lookup table. That is a more intermediate topic that we'll get into in a later video or possibly an extra knowledge video. From here we have our white balance uh, and we have our tone. So white balance, I purposely selected uh, these two uh, pieces of footage because I felt like their white balance was a little bit off. Now white balance, I specifically selected this one because I felt like it was a little too warm. Um, and that's a term that you'll use, uh, you'll hear used often, is warm or cool. Basically, cool footage is footage that looks a bit too blue, and warm footage uh, is footage that is uh, a bit too orange. And that's typically the lights uh, that you're using. Things like uh, incandescent light bulbs are very warm, um, they have a little yellowy orange glow to them. Uh, while well, something like an LED light bulb is a very cool color, or even the sky, the sky on a on a cloudless day is very it's very cool. So when you want to adjust how cool or how warm your thing is, and you can use either one for your own effect. If you want to give uh, otherwise cool footage a more warm look to it, you can increase it to be a little warmer. Uh, so. You'll see over here, now this footage is very orange. I cranked it up all the way. Um, and now this footage looks very orange. I'll actually make this a little bigger. Just so you can see this. So this, this image is now very, very warm. It's very orange. All of our greens have like an orange tint to them. But we can also go the other way. And you'll see that about right here, it looks very natural, like this looks like a, a normal sky. And this is pretty close to what we would call a uh, perfect white balance, or you know, a balanced picture. Um, and that's just where basically the whites are, the, the whitest thing in the picture is pure white. And anything left or right of that is what you would call warm or cool. So about right here, this is where, you know, if you just wanted a plain temperature on your footage, this would be about where it is. Now, if I keep going further, and if I just crank it all the way, you can see now that the sky is very, very blue, but also the wood has kind of a blue tint to it. Uh, all the leaves are kind of a, a bluish color, but you can see that it looks a little different and it has a different feel to it. And that's honestly what temperature, color temperature is supposed to do. It's supposed to give you a different feel. A uh, tool we have here is the white balance selector. Um, if there was an object in the scene or something that was pure white, and you wanted the rest of the if you wanted the rest of the uh, uh, the clip to be sort of matched to that level of whiteness, um, to be sort of balanced out, um, you would use this to select a part of your image that was white. I don't really know if anywhere. So here it's here it made it like a super small adjustment. The sky is blue, and we didn't really want the the scene to be that. So 
I think it would just in this case it would be a better idea to just adjust adjust it manually. I would say about 25% or negative 25 um, is probably a good number to go for this specific image. But certainly if you have like a piece of paper that you just show or even your uh, clapperboard, that should be a good indication of what is pure white. And you can use that to sort of do a, a quick auto match. Tint works in a similar way. Here it's correcting for green and magenta light. Green and magenta being on opposite sides of an RGB color wheel. You can adjust this and you see the white balance actually made a difference. So uh, if we want to give it more of a green tint, we can do that. Or if the footage is too green, you could essentially correct it with uh, the magenta. Again, it works exactly like a temperature, just with uh, green and magenta instead of blue and orange. So we'll reset this back to normal. We have uh, our tone column now. We'll actually just close this up. Um, and so this is for more finely adjusting your brightness and darkness of the image. So what we're actually going to do is, uh, I'm going to bring this back up. I'm going to drag this one in. Oop, wrong one. I'm just going to drag this one in. And we're actually going to demonstrate the other way to adjust uh, images, which is uh, through the timeline. So we have our tone settings right over here, and to explain this better, what we're going to do is we're actually going to change this. So instead of doing going from our source, we're actually going to change the menu to the Metri Scopes. And you'll see that we get this graph here that doesn't really make any sense, even I don't really know what to make of this. So what we're going to do is we're going to go down to the bottom where we have this wrench here, it's settings. And what we're going to do is we're going to change the waveform because this is what this is, this is a waveform. And we're gonna to go to waveform and we're actually going to change it from RGB to Luma. And you'll see now that it becomes black and white. This is going to make a lot more sense. So what this graph means is it's scanning left to right this image, this image right here. And it's saying, okay, along this image, these are the various brightness values. Now, zero here is 0% 0 brightness. That is pure black. 100, that is pure white. In a well-balanced, well-exposed image, what you're wanting to shoot for is your brightness levels, that is uh, zero being 0% 0 brightness, that is black, and 100 being 100% 100 black. You kind of want to aim for your brightness levels to be kind of between these. You don't want to quite hit 100% because anything beyond that uh, is losing detail. You're, you're losing detail now. And you kind of want to keep it just below 100%, um, just because that's, you'll, you'll capture more detail depending on the dynamic range of your camera, which is a whole extra knowledge video. And the same goes for your blacks. Um, you don't want to keep them fully, fully black. Uh, you don't want to just slam this down until it hits zero because again, you're losing detail. So I would say aim for about five to 10%, uh, maybe closer to 10% and 90 to 95% kind of aiming more towards 90 but you can still reach up here. So this is actually a pretty well balanced image right now. Um, again we have our about 10% and about maybe towards more towards 95% but still a really well balanced image. Editor's note here what you're really looking for on a histogram diagram is for the spread of values, the, li the light values, to be evenly distributed across the entire vector scope, or sorry, not vector scope, histogram. So in this example right here, you'll see that the histogram is covers the entire range from, you know, the top to bottom. And of course, there are areas that are shaded. And of course, those are going to be a little darker. But what you want is the entire histogram to be used. You don't want all your values to be, you know, towards the top. You'll see it as like a, a wider um, or a brighter histogram, but you also don't want them all crowded towards the bottom. You'll see a, like a more opaque, um, a little, you know, more of the white towards the, towards the bottom. So just know that. Now, each of these sliders has its own effect on this. So exposure raises all the brightness values just up. So if we expose it, you can see on the Lumetri scope that everything is being pulled up. And if I let go, it'll update. Um, and you can see that things are a lot brighter now, but kind of lost some detail in some of these areas that were 
originally a little more clear. So if we just keep pulling, 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 pulling up all the way to the end, see that's super bright. We can't even, you know, you can tell from context what it is, but it's, you don't get all that detail. You know, all of these leaves that you could originally see before, you could see them and now it's like half of them are still there. I do think I would raise the exposure up just a little bit. To like point, point 0.6. Maybe that's a little high, but we'll adjust that. The next thing is contrast. And what that basically does is pull the top and the bottom apart from the middle. Um, so if I actually bring this back down, you can actually watch the ref as the top gets pulled up higher and the bottom gets uh, pulled down. I'll actually do that again. And if you reduce the contrast, the opposite happens. So you can see as they go back and forth, you'll see that the tops and the bottoms are stretched apart. Um, and this would increase in or decrease your contrast. Contrast just being the difference between the ratio um, between the brightest and the darkest part of your image. So as we increase brightness and contrast, you can see that we get, well, more contrast. You know, the darks look a bit darker, brights look a little brighter. Highlights, they pull the upper portions up without pulling down the bottom. You can see that even though the bottoms are being slightly, slightly affected, it's mostly the top, the upper echelon that uh, gets the most effect. Um, we pull that up, just our brights get brighter, but our darks stay pretty dark. Shadows, it's the same thing, but in reverse, your darks get pulled up or down but your upper upper portions of the image uh, or this, the graph uh, stay about the similar. And whites and blacks are just more extreme versions of highlights and shadows. Uh, with whites, it's really the upper portions that gets pulled up uh, or down. And same with blacks. Just, it's much more hard limit um, being pulled up and down. And saturation is the brightness of color. So we can see that you know, if we reduce all brightness, now this is a black and white image. It's interesting when we need the metric scope. Um, if we turn it all the way up, uh, we have quite a an organic feeling. Um, it looks very orange, and this is actually a good way to tell uh, with your white balance. So if we, turn, if we want it to be very saturated, but want it to be a bit more balanced in color, is bring it down. Okay. Yeah, ten. Yeah, ten will do. Somewhere between negative ten and negative twenty uh, might be nice. As well as uh, adjusting the pinks. Yeah, maybe a seven point five. Or maybe I wouldn't touch it at all. But these are your colors, and you kind of want to get like a more even spread, assuming this is a like well balanced image. Now the creative tab. This is for making creative adjustments to your LUTs. I will explain in a either extra knowledge video or maybe even the intermediate uh, video for this series about what LUTs are. Um, but for now, just kind of think of them as sort of a filter. So what you can do is you can, and right now it doesn't look like it's done much, and that's because it has a 0% intensity right now. So, oh, you can see, you see the thumbnail updated a little bit, so you get kind of a little bit of an idea. But uh, what I'm going to do is, in order to adjust it over here, what we're going to do is we're going to bring up the slider. And you'll see if we put it at 100%, this, I know it's hard to see, but this matches this. Um, you'll see that um, kind of a lot of our cellar color is desaturated. It's not as bright and vibrant, but it has kind of a almost eerie, deathly feel to it. Kind of like old Japanese cinema. But you can also just bump it up to the next level and get even more, even you know, an even more desaturated look. Um, it has quite a, quite a nice feel. Uh, feel to this. I like what it did to this. To reset, uh, what we can do is we can double click uh, and it'll set it back to 100. 
or if you don't want it at all, you can set it back to zero. If you want to see it with the effect, but want to switch back quickly between no effect and effect, what you can do is you can check these check marks. And this works for all of these tabs. You know, you can see each of these tabs has their own check marks, so you can see what you want to keep and what you don't. But the next thing we're going to look at is kind of finer adjustments of these. So you have your, your basic LUT, um, and you can also import uh, your own. If none of these LUTs are interesting to you or you don't quite like it, uh, what you can do is you can adjust, or sorry, import your own. Here, you, um, if you have LUTs downloaded onto your computer, what you can do is you can go to Browse and you can go through and you can find, uh, you can import your own LUTs. Um, you can see that here are the different file formats, .look, .cube, .itx, .lut, .fcccp. All of these are supported uh, LUT formats, and so that's what you can do to, to import your own. So say so you found a LUT. And you know, for this one, we'll use a clean codec. What you can do is make your own adjustments to it and set your intensity, but you can also make more finer adjustments. So with faded film, uh, what you can do is sort of desaturate it. You can see that the exposure for all of the colors has been crushed down quite a bit. Everything is a lot more grayish, and also our colors aren't as saturated. Uh, with sharpen, uh, it'll try to it'll increase the contrast uh, along what it perceives as edges um, in order to increase the the appearance or the contrast of an edge. Um, so if I bump it up, um, if I just bump it up all the way, it doesn't look too bad. Um, there's pros and cons to it. I typically don't use it a lot. Um, on this filter, it looks like it's not um, a huge deal, but you'll experiment when you're using these yourself. With Vibrance, what it does is it'll increase the saturation in low saturation areas, um, as well as avoid uh, skin tones. So if I bump up the Vibrance, you can see that things are a little bit brighter, a little bit, and if I rapidly switch between them, you can see that the brightness or the saturation is just, it's a little bit more uh, a little bit more up there. Maybe I should actually take it off uh, of this LUT. But it might be hard to see, but let me actually move it over because these leaves are where I'm seeing it the most. Uh, so this is with the LUT. This is without. It's super. It's super hard to see. It's super subtle. Um, but like right here, I can see it. Um, but you can see that the the leaves they're a little less saturated here, and a little more there. So that's what vibrance does. Reset. Uh, you can double click a slider and it'll reset to zero. Uh, and saturation saturation does basically the same thing that it did um, up here. Um, it just saturates the. Uh, the image. I'm not going to go over shadow tint and highlight tint. We'll go over those more in a intermediate video. You can mess around with them. They just kind of like color your image one way or another. You can go back and forth. Uh, you can sort of prioritize shadow and highlight, um, but I'll go over more of that in more detail and how to use it sort of more properly uh, in a future video. All right, the next thing that we're going to cover is our curves. We're just going to go over the basics, um, mainly just this contrast curve. Eventually, I will go make a video about all of these other graphs. But for now, we're just going to talk about these uh, main curve. Now, what curves allow you to do is more naturally and more smoothly adjust the contrast, especially in certain areas. So basically what curves do is as you go further and further down this down this graph, things get brighter and brighter. So this is technically black uh, and this is technically white. And the same goes for the vertical axis is say you want your darks a little brighter and your lights a little darker. Typically not the way things go, but we'll go with it. Um, so what you can do is you can click anywhere on this line you can click and then what you can do is you can drag. And you can see that stuff happens when you're messing with it. You can see that things get brighter, things get darker. And you can kind of adjust what you want to do. Um, so you want your 
Sturk's little brighter. There you go. Well, now everything is sort of unilaterally brighter. So if you want to make your brights a little darker, uh, what you can do is you can click further up on this line. You'll see that we have a no created. What we can do is we can drag that down. And you'll see that the graph you'll see what the graph is doing. You can see that the brights things near the top are what's being moved. And you can get really creative with how you want if you want this funky looking graph, um, you can do that. You can add more nodes if you want. You can have a sort of a uh, a bright a bright darks bright darks uh, slightly darker midtones then slightly brighter upper uh, highlights. Get an interesting look. It almost looks like the um, I want to say like the like super old uh, Magic the Gathering cards. I might be completely missing that up, but they look like super. And this picture right here looks like a very old like hand painted card. Uh, playing card. Interesting look if you want to go for that. Um, I don't know how well this would look on with like a human figure uh, in front of it, but it's something to mess around with. So this is for your overall contrast. Um, this is basically adjusting all three channels, your red, your green, and your blue at the same time. However, you can adjust your red, green, and blue separately. So if you go to red, you can see that now we have a red line running through. And you can do the same thing, except you're only adjusting your red channel. So if you want your darker reds to be a little darker, and you want your upper reds to be a little brighter, you can do that. And you'll see that when I uh, darkened the original image, it turned a bit greener. So if I bump it up, it's very, it's very red, very, very, very red. However, if I bring it down, See that we get a sort of uh, greenish color, but basically, if you've ever messed with a RGB color wheel and you messed around with the sliders, you'll see that if you turn down red all the way but leave green and blue all the way up, you'll get cyan. And so that's basically what it's doing: is it's applying, you know, it's bringing it's bringing out the cyan or the relative. It's taking out red, and what it's being left with is cyan. So you can adjust that for all three. So say you want, uh, you know, say you want to make things more blue, um, or rather, yeah, we'll do more blue. So what you can do is, uh, you know, we've already took out some of the red. What we want to do is take out some of the green as well. You actually see that we kind of white balanced it for a second uh, when I brought it up. Almost has a very natural cyan or a white balanced look to it, but of course we can go to much more extremes with it. You know, just if we want, we can take out all of the, um, all of the blue and all of the red, being left with a lot of blue, and we can bump this up even more. So you can get creative with this. I don't typically, you know, I I don't usually go this far with. Uh, Adjustments, I'll usually adjust the, the main contrast one, the white line. Um, and if I want a little bit of tint, you know, um, you know, say I want a little bit more of a reddish tint, you know, I might just go you know, to this far and maybe bring back, bring this back down to a more normal angle. But that really comes with, it with the curves for now. I'll go over the rest of these in a later video. And the last thing that we're going to cover is the vignette. So, funny mishap, uh, there's currently a bug rolling around um, with there's sort of a disagreement between my drivers um, and Adobe Photoshop, or uh, sorry, Adobe Premiere Pro. Uh, so what I'm going to do is come into Adobe Photoshop and tell you basically what a vignette does. So what a vignette does is it's basically a gradient um, and it is a uh, transparent is a transparent to black gradient that goes around the edge of your footage. So right here I have our background image as our uh, tree um, and I have just an empty layer. Um, so what I'm going to do is just gonna drag and I should put it as radial. 
So this is an extreme version of what a vignette does. So if I were to do it actually, right, I might try and go a little further. But you can see that around the edges you get a little darker and it kind of focuses uh, your view on whatever is brightest. Actually zoom out a bit more. So what the basic settings do is uh, amount will determine whether you have a black or a white vignette. Um, this, you know, this, well, I have it as black um, for this example, but it'll determine whether you have a white or a black vignette um, and how intense it'll be. Um, so it'll either be, you know, very faint, you know, say you had this at like 20% opacity. Uh, oops, wrong one. Say so you had this at like 20% opacity um, or 100% opacity. Uh, midpoint determines how far up or down uh, the center of the uh, vignette will be. Uh, you have roundness, um, and that'll determine whether you have a like perfectly circular uh, vignette or more of a uh, squared off, like a rounded box around the edges. And then you have feather, and that determines how how far that gradient goes. So you can either have a here to here. It's actually a just to do this better. It'll determine whether you have one that's uh, like this or like this, so much more uh, feathered out. So that's a smoother, smoother transition. This is still pretty intense, um, and I don't think Premiere Pro will allow you to get um, sort of that like right down in the center um, look, but. But that's the general gist of what it does. And that'll do it for this video. Thank you very much for watching. I hope you enjoyed. You have a good one.